Um, yeah, so for something completely different now. Um, hello, my name is Anna. Um, I am a PhD student at the University of Oxford. And um, I am going to present some work on tetrakainite, specifically its identification with various um, microscopy and magnetic methods. Um, this is not a complete study, so um, if anyone has any feedback on where to go next, what methods to apply, what, um, how to improve existing methods, that would be very helpful. I'm just going to find the pointer. There we are. Um, Tetrathionite is a mineral which has received a lot of interest from the magnetic, from, from the meteorite uh, magnetism community. Um, in particular, meteorites have been used for magnetic studies because they contain um, abundant metal and usually, um, usually oxides and really interesting microstructures. So they're really interesting um, targets for magnetic studies. Um, in particular, they've been used for um, the identification of ancient magnetic fields. And the reason for that is that um, we can use um, magnetic studies to get insight into the structure of terrestrial bodies, like ancient ter terrestrial bodies. We can get a lot of information like the timing of their accretion, whether they differentiated, whether they um, formed an inner core, um, the that whether they form the inner core and how they form the size of parent body. Um, and a lot of basically really fascinating information about the early solar system with implications to um, solar system evolution and early magnetic fields and Earth's own magnetic field through um, comparisons. And that's all great, but there is, of course, a but. Um, meteorites have incredibly complex histories. Sometimes they combine um, impact studs of what they combine impacts, aqueous alteration, metamorphism. And so what we need in order to get all of this really cool information is um, very, um, very reliable magnets. One such magnet has been identified as tetrathionite. Um, so this is the ordered, um, ordered form of thionite, which is iron nickel um, with high nickel. So tetrathionite is generally between 50 and 55% nickel. And it forms through very slow cooling through the ordering temperature of tetrathionite, so um, 310 degrees. Um, importantly, it's been identified to have incredibly high coercivity, so up to two tesla. tesla. Um, and all of these meteorites are ones where tetrathionite has been identified as a reliable carrier. Now, one meteorite, that, one meteorite group, which is known to contain abundant tetrathionite, which is not on this list, is um, the mesosiderite. The mesosiderites are stony iron meteorites with approximately um, equal parts metal and silica. They're generally considered to be mixtures of core material and crustal or mantle material. Um, so they probably involved some kind of impact at some point in their history, but this is all not very well understood. In any case, crucially, they are known to have an extremely slow cooling rate, the slowest cooling rate we know of any rock. Um, so that's less than one degree per million years. So at that slower cooling rate, tetrathionite is present in quite large amounts. Um, so because they have a, a relatively poorly understood history and because there's tetrathionite present, we thought we would apply um, several um, experimental techniques to compare them and see how, like which one is best for identified single domain tetrathionite. Um, so here, here are the methods that we used so far. Um, we use scanning electron microscopy with EDS and EDSD, as well as some limited chemical analysis with the electron microprobe, which I will mention briefly but not dwell on. Um, and here are um, some Volk magnetic measurements um, that were done so far. Uh, the sample used was um, Esteville. It was a class out of uh, so Esteville is a breccia. Uh, my sample is one class of this breccia on uh, loan from the Oxford Museum of Natural History. Um, and I've separated, well, I've cut off three chips of this main mass, which the measurements are done on. Um, very briefly, um, a tour on the petrology of this. So as I mentioned, it's almost equal parts metal. So that's represented by camasite here with some internal variation, which I'm gonna talk, talk about in a minute and silicates. So this is um, a metamorphous basalt assemblage with um, plagioclase and pyroxenes with some accessory minerals. And then there's also sulfide and some phosphate. Well, no, one phosphate. Um, 
to identify identify tetratinite, what we are looking for first is just high nickel metal. So this is present first and foremost within the camera side, which is lower nickel. So as part of, for example, the cloudy zone. Now, Mises and Wright are so slowly cool that the cloudy zone actually grew, um, the, the, the tetratinite islands in the cloudy zone actually grew too large. So they are in multi-domain state, um, which is why they were not the focus of the study. We actually looked at the silicates because um, multi-domain tetrapenite is, um, is, not, is not particularly helpful. So focusing on the silicate instead, um, it turns out that metal grains within the silicon matrix are actually fa fairly common. So they um, come together with either sulfide, um, which is troilide or camasite. Um, and they are quite abundant and they don't seem to have very much microstructure. Um, all of these were identified with both um, EDS and electron probe as high nickel, so about 54% nickel generally. Um, but this is not actually enough to identify tetratinite because there's compositional overlap between um, tetratinite and tenite. So then we've applied um, EBSD to get structural information on the crystal. And they were all identified successfully as tetratinite, um, which was great. Um, this is a tiny EBSD map for timing constraints of one of these grains. Um, but then, of course, these grains are a few tens of microns across generally. They are still not um, small enough. So I've gone even smaller. So um, it turns out there are some nanometric inclusion, inclusions of sulfide and uh, metal in some silicate crystals. So here is um, a minimal intergroup between chromite and tridomite in an enstatite host. This is all, this is really interesting, but I don't have time to talk about it. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is these inclusion trails here. Majority of these are sulfide, but some of them are metal and some of them are small enough and high nickel enough to be, um, uh, to be, to have the potential to be tetrachinite. There we go. I don't know if you can see it um, there, there's a very, very tiny, about 70 nanometers tetrotinite grain, well, um, high nickel grain. So then I've gone and I've tried to uh, do EBSD on this, um, and I've run into a lot of resolution issues. Um, EBSD, at least the way I did it, didn't really cope with that, that, that level of small sizes. So that wasn't great because I couldn't establish that this was tetrotinite. Now, given that it was present in the rest of the sample, then it's a fair assumption that, well, I hope it's a fair assumption that the whole sample did not get reheated above the ordering temperature for long enough for tetratinite to go back to tetratinite. Um, But still, it couldn't be established um, confidently. One final thing I would say on this, if we zoom out, it turns out these um, inclusions are actually quite common. So they continue around here and this crystal is actually um, about twice the size that is shown here. And there is another one of it in the sample. So, th so these are quite com common, these um, nanometric inclusions. So I thought, barring the fact that I couldn't um, identify tetratinite, they would still be quite interesting for some kind of localized magnetic study. Um, I started the magnetic part of the study with um, just bulk measurements. And I got this. Now, I do apologize if my glider belt triggers some kind of um, fight or flight response. Um, um, I'm told, well, I hope that these are quite common in meteoric studies. Um, what we see here in both samples um, is a low coercivity component which demagnetizes by 12 to 15 millitesla, and there is no stable high coercivity component. On top of this, um, the low coercivity component actually contains most of the NRM. So um, essentially the high coercivity spectrum just doesn't really have any helpful information. So I've gone and I've um, done some IRM acquisition experiments to find out what is present in the sample according to uh, magnetism as opposed to microscopy. Um, and the first one is not particularly interesting. So here we have uh, the IRM acquisition curve and the differential. Um, and we just see, uh, what is representative for multi-domain camasite with a peak there at um, low fields. But if we go to the next sample, um, some extra peaks show up in, in here in the coercivity spectrum. 
And there is again the peak for um, multi domain camasite. Now, another peak has appeared for multi domain tetrapenite, um, which has been identified as such before in a few papers. There is also a tiny peak here, 500 meters, which I'm not entirely sure how to identify, but it is based on just the one um, data point. So I would actually like to go and do this experiment again and get more, um, get higher resolution of the higher fields to see exactly what this is and if, if the peak stays there. In any case, um, there is no or very limited tetrapena here because for reference, here's what um, the curve would look like if there was single domain tetrapena present. So it starts jumping up at 600 millitesla. Uh, mine, if anything, saturates the 600. So um, conclusion here is that I, we have little or no single domain tetrapena present. Um, which is a bit strange because, well, it was unclear from the nanometric um, inclusions that those high nickel grains were tetrapenite, but it was likely. Um, from magnetism, I found that there's no, well, very little single domain tetrapenite. So um, essentially the only reasonable conclusion here is um, in magnets we trust when it comes to tetrapenite. Um, and very briefly, I want to talk about implications for the parent body. Um, there is no stable high coercivity signal. This means either there was nothing to record, so that could be because the mesoteric and the parent body never had a magnetic field, perhaps it didn't differentiate completely, um, or perhaps the magnetic field shut off too early, so either because of cooling and the shut off the dynamo, or perhaps because of an uh, impact, um, as I mentioned before, an impact has been hypothesized to be part of the um, um, mesocellular formation history. So perhaps a destructive impact shot of the dynamo. It is also possible that the field was in fact too low intensity um, to be recorded. So if the fidelity, if the sample fidelity of Estabil is not high enough. So because of this, the immediate next step is to go and do some air and fidelity experiments. Um, I was going to do this in March and then there was a pandemic. So this is, this is happening as soon as I can get back into a lab. Um, and in longer term, I would like to get high resolution EDSD maps of um, metals and um, higher resolution, well, look at the microstructure as well. Um, higher resolution iron acquisition, as I mentioned before, and I am curious about applying in situ magnetic techniques to those inclusions. But at the same time, I am aware that music are just not very good for magnetic studies, it turns out. So maybe this is a little bit of a dead end, but I'm very interested in hearing opinions. Thank you. Thank you. So do we have any questions? Yeah, nice talk. Um, I was gonna ask about your, your EBSD. Uh, so you were, uh, able to identify tetratainite in your EBSD patterns. Right. It, was that based on uh, you had enough resolution to detect the, the tetragonal distortion of, of the tetratainite, or were you able to pick up the, 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 the extra uh, diffraction peaks that you get because of the ionical ordering? Um, so it identified the tetragonal structure of the tetratainite. All of these grains in the matrix were remarkably homogenous. There wasn't really anything going on in them. Um, but no, it didn't really identify peaks about um, on, on distortion or anything like that. But, but the, that would be really interesting. The distortion's to... enough. You, you, you can confidently distinguish the qubit from the tetragonal. Uh... Yeah, uh, this was based on the um, on a tetragonal reference file from the uh, American Neurology database, I believe. OK, that's good, yeah. yeah. It may be nice yeah. to try that on the, we, we did try, wanted to, try that on the cloudy zone in the Mesa Siderites to see if you could identify the differently oriented uh, variants within the cloudy zone. I think that would be that would be very interesting. It looks, it's looking like you're getting very nice data. Uh, so that would be a, an interesting. Yeah, I was um, tentatively pointing the uh, pointing the gun at the cloudy zone um, with um, with EBSD, but I was actually getting really, really messy patterns. I'm guessing either the the uh, the length scale of the microstructures were 
smaller than the resolution that ABNZ had at that, that particular moment. But yeah, I think that would be interesting. Yeah, it's not easy. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can't imagine it. Mm. Okay. Yeah, any more questions? Uh, I'll just ask a, a quick question. Just uh, on the in situ magnetic techniques that you plan to use. Um, so what specifically are you thinking? And you know, do you think you can you can get to the resolution that you need? Um, so I was tentatively thinking about squid microscopy or maybe um, quantum dynamic microscopy. This was all sort of put on hold by COVID because we realized we need to go abroad to do these things. Um, so I have not thought about them in detail, but I think the resolution is possible.